welcome to Raz Reviews. Today I'm doing something a little different. I'm doing a director's profile where I want to talk about the style and the signatures of a certain director and what makes him so special and different than anybody else. Martin Scorsese has The Irishman out now on Netflix, which is an unbelievable experience. We have uh, Robert De Niro um, reuniting with Martin Scorsese, Joe Pesci coming out of retirement to do this film, and Al Pacino working with these guys for the first time in history. And the technology of de-aging is gonna give us an unbelievable tale that spans decades and decades of story. I am very excited about this film. I actually need time to absorb it before I can review it. But I thought before I do that, I wanna talk about the director himself. As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. My name is Jordan Belfort. Not him. Me. That's right. I'm a former member of the middle class, raised by two accountants in a tiny apartment in Bayside, Queens. He's one of the most influential, powerful, and iconic figures in recent cinema history. He holds the record for the, the second most Oscar nominations. I believe he has eight nominations so far. He's a big deal, and I can't wait to talk about him, about his work, and what makes him different from everybody else. And what are his signature moves or storytelling techniques that he uses that are specific to him? Because it's the stuff that makes his movies memorable, iconic, and definitely Scorsese movies. And that's the thing, his movies are so unique to him, he has his own personal touch that define him and differentiate him from everybody else. So for example, when we're talking about a Martin Scorsese movie, there's always an element of a world that he takes us into and introduces us to that otherwise we wouldn't have an access to, whether it's the world of the gangsters or the wise guys, the stock market, the boxing world, the casinos of Las Vegas, whatever it is, it's like he has tickets to a backstage that we can never get to and he just takes us in and ropes us in and lets us see this world from a new perspective by being in the middle of it. And a lot of times it's worlds that are looked down upon in society and he basically gives us perspective when he shows us how this world actually works and a lot of times he's telling us that the world is worse than we think or maybe better than we think or maybe a little bit of both the worlds that are presented in the scorsese movies are worlds that we judge from far away because we're not gonna go and be wise guys but what he does is that he challenges our understanding of these worlds by providing us this intimate level of access into them, and it's a signature Scorsese move. A common thing you find in his movies is the type of main character, or his journey. His main characters always come from the bottom. They work very, very hard at what they do, and they rise in the ranks uh, very quickly because of how good they are at a certain thing. And then, at some point, they become too big for their own good, and they come crashing down. And that's because Scorsese likes to deal with the themes of ego, power, and control. And basically, he's always saying that no matter how big or powerful you get, everybody can fail, and everybody can be their own worst enemy, and everybody could end up with nothing, even after having everything. So no matter who we are, anybody can easily be destroyed. And also to consider the fact that the quicker the rise, the quicker the fall. I personally really like the messages that I always find in this film where he's telling us that it's our ego that gets in our way. It's not external factors, they're there, but most of the time his main characters fall because of their own ego and their own hubris and how they believe that now that they've gotten the power and the control that they've been after, like they are untouchable, but they are touchable. And that's why Scorsese always dedicates a large amount of time to that downfall, for us to watch that person crumble into nothing and maybe learn something at the end of the day. Another pattern you find in Scorsese movies is his editing. He edits movies 
in a crazy way. And that's why he actually mostly works with the same editors. He had a female editor work with him for a very long time. But it's because there aren't a lot of editors who can deal with his crazy manic edits. His movies are so fast paced and involve so many fast cuts that he has unbelievable amounts of coverage. And it needs an editor who has a lot of patience to have so many cuts and so many shots. And that's the thing. With Scorsese, you might find a very long take with a camera that's following through an insane setup of going through alleyways and areas into a world that he's showing us. Or you can find very fast cuts and edits and montages that involve hundreds and hundreds of shots. It's crazy. And there's also an editing pattern in his structure. A lot of the times he chooses to start a film in the ending of the story or in a pivotal moment in the middle of the story. And then he goes back and shows us how we got there. As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. We see that in Goodfellas, we see it in Casino, we see it in Raging Bull. And it's a really cool thing that he does because he manages to A, catch our attention immediately. He starts the film in a very big moment and immediately captures your curiosity and you are in, you're in for the ride from the beginning. That's why I enjoy the openers of his movies a lot. They're like a slap in the face and you pay attention. He also loves his freeze frames. My name is Jordan Belfort. But after a while, Nikki, Ginger, Ace, all of them could have wound up getting killed. His movies are full of freeze frames, but they're not random. He freezes the frame in, again, pivotal moments for his characters because Scorsese really focuses on character stories and journeys. Let's take, for example, Goodfellas. In Goodfellas, there are certain areas in the film where we freeze frame on our main character, Henry Hill. Go back and try to notice when the freeze frames happen. They always happen in a very important moment in Henry's life where he learns something that pushes him towards the path he ends up on. Like a freeze frame when he first meets Jimmy, a very important character in his life, and when he sees violence and he learns that violence is actually power and it's attractive to him. And also when for the first time he feels like he can't trust Jimmy, his friend, and realizes that now he has to betray the mafia. Jimmy had never asked me to whack somebody before, but now he's asking me to go down to Florida and do a hit with Anthony. That's when I knew I would never have come back from Florida alive. It's very specific what he does, and he does it because he wants us to pay attention in the moments that he wants, which is very controlling of him, no? Another reoccurring thing in many of Martin's films is his use of voiceover. Now, voiceover is very tricky, and it can be really lame if it's not used well, but he's practically the king of using voiceover. It's because he doesn't use voiceover as a lazy tool to help him tell the story without showing it. That's not what he uses it for. He uses voiceover in order to break the barrier between us and his main characters. And there's a reason for that. It's because when you think about it, his protagonists are not good people. They're horrible people who do horrible things. They're very unlikable. If we didn't have that voiceover to connect with them and like them, he uses that voiceover to break the fourth wall and make us feel like we're friends with his characters. We're buddies. I don't want to be a product of my environment. Paulie didn't talk to six people. Well, look, there's not much of a difference anyway, is there? Especially that the bosses made the Teamsters lend him the money. Are working their magic on Donnie right now. And that's why when they do horrible things, we don't hate them and we also root for them. And even when they are in their downfall, we sympathize with them. And that's why he gets accused of being somebody who maybe portrays violence or crime in a nice way. It's because when you're watching, you don't go like, oh, he shouldn't have done that, that's a crime. No, you're in, you're like, yeah, do it, rob, kill that guy, you know? And a lot of that is thanks to that voiceover that he puts there. Didn't matter, didn't mean anything. When I was broke, I would go out and rob some more. We ran everything. We paid off cops, we paid off lawyers, we paid off judges. Everybody had their hands out. Everything was for the taking. 
and now it's all over. Something that most people don't pay attention to in Martin Scorsese movies is the sound, but man, is it important in his films once you pay attention to it. Forget about what he's famous for, which is music and the use of rock music uh, and 50s swing music in his movies, especially music by the Rolling Stones. You see it in almost most of his films, but I'm talking about the actual sound design of his films. His movies are famous for being very, very loud. Wake up, you piece of shit! I, 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 but they actually have specific moments when they are not loud at all. They're actually very, very quiet. And those quiet moments are so effective in contrast with all the noise and chaos that you hear all the time. And it's when he decides to use a high volume or a, a very complicated sound design versus when he doesn't barely have any sound working at all. Take, for example, this scene from Raging Bull, which is not a quiet film. Give it a fairly well Come and on. rock Jake LaMotta on, Ray. right Come on. the field. Come on, Ray. meticulous in his sound design and in bringing everything down and bringing everything inside the main character. And that's why a lot of the moods and experiences in his films are very iconic and unique. And when you leave the movie, they stick with you. And the main characters whose experience we feel so deeply stay with us for a very long time and they become iconic characters that people know and can't forget about. You also got to remember that his movies are fun and loud and very violent, there's always crime, <laughs> there's a lot of murder and blood, and there's a lot of dark comedy as well, and they're almost always almost over the top and big. They really leave an impression, and that's the point. And of course, speaking of iconic characters, Martin Scorsese creates working relationships with certain actors, and that's why you see the same actors repeated in a lot of his film. People like Robert De Niro, um, Joe Pesci, and of course, recently, Leonardo DiCaprio. And the reason for that is those guys really love Martin Scorsese's tendency to allow a lot of improv. Well, I'm funny how? I mean, funny like I'm a clown, I amuse you, I make you laugh. And because also Martin does a lot of work on characters and character stories, like I was saying. This helps actors a lot get into the role and actually give a fabulous performances. And a lot of these guys owe a lot of Oscar nominations and wins to Martin Scorsese. And improv is a big part of it. A lot of scenes for Martin Scorsese are improvised. This, of course, is a nightmare to his crew. It's actually rumored that there's this one time, I think it's in Raging Bull, where he, the first AD, the person in charge of the schedule, was locked out of the set because he wanted to stop the improvising from happening and Martin Scorsese wouldn't let him and he kept improvising going for hours. It's crazy. And it's also crazy for the editor because he gets massive meters of film to edit, so much of it. But what this does is A, it allows the characters to really invest and dig deep into their characters and become them. It's basically a playing field for actors. It's also very effective for the authenticity. The characters in Martin Scorsese's films feel real. I look at these people, I know it's Robert De Niro, but I don't. I think it's his character. He's a wise guy. He's Jimmy. I don't see him as anybody else, which is crazy because of how recognizable these guys are. But it's just they feel so real the way they talk and the way they behave. It's because of the, that improvisation and that reality, that hyper realism that he has. So at the end of the day, what makes Martin Scorsese so special and unique and a fantastic director is the fact that he uses so many of the tools of cinema to tell a story. He is not straightforward and he doesn't shy away from digging deep into character stories and digging deep into the worlds that he's introducing us to. And he uses everything from insane camera moves to insane edits to technologies to acting to improvising, everything, all the tools that are at his disposal in the cinema toolbox 
to give you that story the best way possible. He's a fantastic storyteller and an amazing world builder. And with that, he doesn't just show you a movie. He gives you a human experience that you are not likely to forget anytime soon. And that's what makes his films stay with us for such a long time after we've seen them. Days later, you still think about them and feel them. And that's what also makes his films so iconic and what makes him one of the most important directors in modern cinema. I hope you guys liked this video and I hope you liked hearing me talk about one of my favorite directors. Let me know in the comments section what are your top three Martin Scorsese films. And as always, like, share and subscribe and let me know what you'd like me to review for you next. See ya.